And good evening. Top story coming to you live tonight from Washington, D.C., as we're just hours away from President Biden's State of the Union address. Here's a live look at our nation's capital tonight, where the president will give his fourth and most consequential address ahead of the 2024 election. Biden hoping to capitalize on the televised speech to convince voters he's deserving of a second term. The address coming on the heels of Super Tuesday, effectively setting up a Trump-Biden rematch this November. But Biden is up against significant challenges. Low approval ratings over the economy, his handling of the border crisis, and his stance on the Israel-Hamas war. On top of all that, major concerns over his age and mental acuity. The president expected to tackle some of those issues this evening, including a new effort to bring more aid to Gaza and news of a port that the U.S. will help build for those Palestinians in desperate need of food plans to revamp the tax code and lower prescription pills for Americans. Another issue Biden hopes will drive voters to the polls, abortion. In an excerpt from his speech, the president says, quote, if Americans send me a Congress that supports the right to choose, I promise you I will restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. Heading into tonight, President Biden has the lowest approval rating. You see it here for a president fine for a second term compared to any of his predecessors. Will he be able to turn things around tonight? NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander starts us off. Tonight, President Biden set to make a crucial sales pitch facing a skeptical audience and low approval ratings. In just release excerpts of tonight's address, the president will say it doesn't make the news, but in thousands of cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. And as they head to a likely rematch, this subtle dig at former President Trump, some other people my age see a different story, an American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution. That's not me. Recent polls show the president trails his likely Republican challenger within the margin of error. The president will sharply contrast his views with Mr. Trump's on key issues like abortion rights. It was Donald Trump and his Supreme Court who ripped away the rights and freedoms of women in America. Among the first ladies' guests tonight, Kate Cox, who sued Texas over its near-total abortion ban. And he'll announce new efforts to deliver desperately needed aid to Gaza with a new land crossing and a U.S.-led mission to build a temporary seaport. But tonight, much of the focus will be on the president's presentation, with three-quarters of Americans concerned President Biden does not have the mental and physical health to serve. And on the border crisis, President Biden will blame Republicans for rejecting a bipartisan border security bill. The only reason the border is not secure is Donald Trump and his MAGA Republican friends. A record 8.6 million migrants have entered the U.S. during the Biden presidency. Republicans argue the president could end the crisis by bringing back the Trump border policies he reversed. Today, Mr. Trump attacking the president on the economy as consumer prices have risen 18 percent since President Biden took office. We had the greatest economy in the history of the world. It's time to tell crooked Joe Biden, you're fired. The president's expected to tout strong job growth and unemployment at a 50-year low following the pandemic. Keisha Age, a single mom of three in Atlanta, is working two jobs and struggling with high prices. What do you want to hear from the president tonight? Basically, that things are going to get better and that things are going to become more affordable and that people are actually going to be able to live as opposed to surviving. Peter Alexander joins us tonight live from the White House. Peter, what more can you tell us about the preparations that went into the address tonight? We know that the president was working on this speech at Camp David. Yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. The president spent most of the weekend at Camp David alongside some of his top advisors. The historian John Meacham was there as well with him to try to frame his vision going forward. But also this comeback story, as he describes it, following the global pandemic and the crisis that affected our supply chain, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. I was speaking to a senior advisor just as I was coming out to speak to you right now. They say keep a real close eye on what the president's going to say about the stakes in this election going forward, specifically as it relates to the topic of democracy. The president's been preparing for this moment, a crucial moment for him, for months, dating all the way back to December. And as it relates to the possibility of hecklers tonight, the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, Tom, has told members of his party to be respectful tonight. But a progressive Democrat, Cori Bush today, who is a fierce critic of the president's handling of the war in Gaza, did not rule out a possible protest of her own in the chamber. Tom. And then, Peter, you mentioned Kate Cox. Katie Cox will be joining the First Lady Jill Biden as a guest tonight. What other guests do we know about? 
Yeah, Kate Cox, obviously, as it relates to the issue of reproductive rights, there's going to be another woman who's going to be up there who um, used IVF to have a child in her family, given all we have seen right now with the situation in Alabama just yesterday, finally uh, putting a law in place that would allow for IVF. But it doesn't erase the issue altogether that was um, that was ruled by the state's Supreme Court. Sean Fain, he is the United Auto Workers president. He's going to be there alongside the first lady as well. It's a reminder of the fact that President Biden was the first sitting president to go on the picket lines alongside union workers who were striking. He has the support of the United Auto Workers Union right now. And notably, Maria Shriver is going to be there as well. She is a, a women's health and advocate on behalf of Alzheimer's in particular. And on top of that, she happens to be the first cousin of Robert uh, F. Kennedy Jr., who obviously many Democrats worry could take some votes away from President Biden uh, as it comes up to the next election this November, Tom. Yeah, his candidacy has caused some rifts in that family. Peter, we yeah. thank you tonight. For more on what we can expect from President Biden's State of the Union address, I want to bring in our political pros tonight. Hogan Gidley is a former Trump White House principal deputy press secretary, Democratic strategist Amisha Cross, and David Plouffe, former Obama campaign manager and senior advisor, and NBC News political analyst as well. We thank you all for being here on one of the biggest political nights of the year. David, I'm going to start with you. Two questions. If you could have the last chat with the president before he departs the White House for the House chamber, what would you tell him? And can he stumble tonight, or is the spotlight just too bright? Well, Tom, having helped prepare presidents for moments like this, I think uh, you don't want to talk too much uh, when they're getting in the zone. So I'd probably say very little. Your goal is to get help get them prepared so they don't need last-minute advice. I, I do think what he says is important, but I think given some of the concerns voters say about age, uh, I think how he says it is going to be even more important. Um, strength and vigor, um, the delivery needs to be strong. If there are protests, hopefully he will handle that quickly and with strength. So uh, it is a big moment. I mean, I don't want to overstate it because a lot of Americans aren't going to watch it, but it's probably the biggest direct audience he'll have uh, until the first debate with Donald Trump, assuming they do debate. Um, obviously, a lot of Americans will see clips on social media sites, TikTok, Instagram. So, uh, you know, whatever the original audience is, you're also going to have the ability to, you know, multiply that, particularly if you have some good lines. And, and looking at some of the excerpts, I think there's some lines around um, abortion, clearly, that should get people's attention around Gaza, around taxes. So uh, it's a big moment. And, and listen, in a race that's going to be this close, particularly when you are behind, You've got to seize every moment and really capitalize, whether that's an interview, whether it's your own piece of content you're putting out here, but particularly something like this, where you've got the political stage by yourself, uh, really for the last time. His convention speech on August in Chicago will be the only other time, really, where he has a sizable audience uh, that's kind of there uh, and he's got command of the podium. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a debate, but we're going to have to wait and see. The jury's still out on that one. Amisha, I, I want to talk to you now. If we look at other presidents at this point, right, in their presidencies, I have a graphic I want to put up on the screen for our viewers here. President Biden's approval rating is lagging behind all of them, including former President Trump. And his polling against his opponent is behind nearly everyone as well. What can Biden do to start to turn this around tonight? I think he's got to focus in on the policies and the wins that he's had, and he's had some sizable ones. We look at what he's done with student debt and student debt relief. Um, millions of Americans across this country no longer have to worry about the drastic burden of student debt. We look at what he's done for um, for prescription drugs, reducing prescription drug prices, particularly the cost of insulin for some of our um, seniors and people most at risk for um, various uh, other illnesses associated with it. We also look at what this president did to bring us back from the pandemic. I think that people forget about where America was just a few short years ago. Just like we say that, you know, South Carolina basically um, pulled Biden out of life support, at the end of the day, Biden pulled America off of life support when it came to ensuring that we got back on track. And I think that that, the infrastructure plan, all of the jobs created, right now we have the lowest unemployment that this nation has seen in a very long time. Black unemployment is at record lows. He has a lot to run on. I think he needs to remind the American people. Of remind it. them, right, because the polling shows Americans, they, they, they don't believe the economy is getting better. They don't feel it just yet. Hogan, you've been in these war rooms right on the other yeah. side. Mm, sure. If you're an effective aide, you're going to be watching this speech. What are you going to be looking to sort of weaponize against the 
the president. What are you watching out for? Well, uh, several things. First of all, the bar has been set really low here from a physical, mental. Is it mental, though? But uh, is the bar low? Because I think if there's any stumbles, if there are any mistakes, people are going to be on top of him. Right, but if there aren't, they'll say, look how great the speech was. Forget the policy he talks about in the speech, which most Americans don't feel uh, any improvement in their lives because there isn't any. I mean, you have to have $11,400 a year more now than you did when Joe Biden first took office. Prices for gas, for groceries, for cars, for houses, for rent, all exorbitantly higher than they were under Donald Trump previously. We have wars breaking out all over the world. Uh, the country uh, obviously has crime spiking in its major cities. The southern border, the number one issue facing this country right now, and voters all say that's what they're most concerned about. And Joe Biden's going to get up there after three years of saying it's not a crisis. He's going to say it is a crisis and it's the Republicans' fault. No one believes that because he absolutely turned over everything Donald Trump did, bragged about it, and owned a, a, a complete 180 on border policy. Now we see what's happening with human trafficking, uh, child smuggling, uh, drugs, fentanyl, killing our, our, our citizens, what it's doing to our health care system, what it's doing to our school system. Everything that cripples our country is being caused in large measure because of Joe Biden's policies, not just on the southern border, but other places. So look for Republicans to push back in those areas. The temperature's clearly hot. We know Speaker Johnson has asked uh, the Republicans to sort of be respectful, if you will. Do do you think there's going to be a back and forth like we've seen in, in past states of the union? Oh, well, I'm, I would expect there to be some back and forth between a lot of folks, a lot of members. David, I want to come back to you on something Amisha brought up here. I want you to read a portion of Biden's address tonight that NBC News has received from the White House. Here's what it says. It says, I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in our nation's history, and we have. It doesn't make the news, but in thousands of cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. David, sounds like he's going to focus on an economic message and yet three and four voters aren't happy with the way the economy is going right now. Can you basically shout at people to tell them the economy is getting better? Or do they have to actually feel it? Well, they have to feel it. And I think you are beginning to see things like the Consumer Confidence Index rise pretty significantly over the last two months. So I would expect over the course of this year, those numbers will get a little bit better. Um, but I think you've got to make your case. And I think context is important, which is one of the reasons the economy was so weak was Donald Trump uh, kind of historically mishandled the pandemic. And we've had to dig out from that. And, and I think when you look at the numbers right now, and again, these are polls in March, so let's be careful about taking them too seriously. But, you know, Trump does have an advantage over President Biden on the economy. I think the, what the president and his campaign will want to do is, you know, narrow that as much as possible. But, but there's really important questions beneath just the who's better on the economy. Who will fight for working people? You know, who will look after the wealthy? Who will look after workers? And I think Joe Biden can probably win that battle on, listen, I'm going to focus every day on people who didn't go to college, people making thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. Donald Trump's already said that he will offer more massive tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. And those things are just horribly unpopular. So I think that's what he has to do. But yeah, I've learned in politics, you can't tell anybody how they ought to feel. You can make the case about what you've done, what your opponent would do, what we've built back from. And as people begin to feel a little bit better, hopefully, that can help. But I saw this in 2012, you know, <coughs> Barack Obama won re-election with a historically high unemployment rate. It was getting better. So that's kind of what voters thought about. They weren't still happy about where they were, yeah. but they felt that things were getting better. Amisha, let's take a look at another portion of the speech, right? I want to get your take on this. Um, this one was just released as well. It's addressing one of the key issues of this campaign, which we know is abortion. Here's, a, here, here's what it says. It says, clearly those bragging about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women in America. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot and won in 2022, 2023, and they will find out again in 2024. There's no doubt this is one of the Democrats' most important issues this year. Do you think it will to use lack of a better term, Trump, uh, issues like the economy, issues like immigration? I think it will, especially amongst women voters and younger voters, um, particularly women of reproductive age. This is a galvanizing issue across multiple sides of the political spectrum. Women do not want to have the government tell us what to do with our bodies. Women want to be able to make that decision on their own. They want to be able to family plan, be mindful that this isn't just about IVF or abortion rights. It's also about birth control. Holistically, we've seen various states um, push for actions 
regulations that remove access to birth control. There is a lot here, and I think that women are, quite frankly, teed off about it, and they're also showing up at the polls um, in, in midterm elections. They're showing up in special elections. Whenever this is a ballot initiative or ballot issue, the Democrats always win, and they win because even with uh, less restrictive policies, as Republicans would like to call the ones that have um, exceptions for the life of the mother, they're determining where the mother's life is at risk. Does that mean she's, you know, two steps from her heart stopping? Does that mean that she's already passed on? At what point do, are they saying that this is okay to pursue? And they're taking the responsibility away from the woman and her doctor, which is a conversation that we need to have, which is one that I think Nikki Haley, before she exited the race, actually had. She believes that that conversation between a woman and her doctor should stay that way if right. it is IVF. She does not believe the same thing for abortion rights. I think that that is a huge problem. And what we've seen in poll after poll and actually at the ballot box is that this matters to people. It's a galvanizing issue, and I don't know why Republicans keep pressing on it, because they lose every time. And, and if Republicans had hoped it would sort of go away or voters would forget about it, the IVF issue sort of brought it back full center. On that point, I want to ask you about the Republican response. We have an Alabama senator that a lot, not a lot of people in the nation may know or recognize, but she's got a compelling story. Why do you think Republicans chose her? Well, a lot of reasons. I think um, she's an extremely good orator. I heard her speak several times. Um, she can speak to things that obviously some of the other members of the Senate can. I mean, she's from a southern state. Uh, a lot of people say she's on the short list to be vice president of the United States, too. And look, she's a young mother. She's a young mother. This is a situation where no one really wants this position because it's kind of a, a, a lose-lose. It sometimes lose. comes with a curse. Yeah. Yes, it's kind of a lose-lose, but I think Tim Scott did a great job with it. I think Sarah Huckabee Sanders did a great job with it, and I think Katie Britt's going to do a good job as well. She just needs to get out there and articulate not just the Republican vision, but push back on a lot of the things that How do, that how do Republicans sort of, how, how do they balance that, though, right? Right. Um, they, they clearly are, are for measures against abortion, but at the same time, they know they have to win in November. How does she deliver that message? Well, I don't know how she's going to deliver it, uh, but I would argue uh, this issue has obviously been something in the forefront of Americans' minds for a long time. And after the overturning of Roe v. Wade, a lot of people in this country uh, waited for Republicans to talk about it, and we just went silent. I thought mm -hmm. that was a big mistake. Uh, Sixty-eight uh, percent of people thought when Roe v. Wade was overturned that it outlawed abortion in this country. Obviously, the best misinformation, disinformation campaign of our time, because that's not what it did. Send it back to the state. States took their own tax. Some of them went stronger. Some of them went weaker. But the fact is, we need to go on the offense here and explain where most of the people in this country are policy-wise. Somewhere around the 15th, 16th week, doctor says the babies can feel pain. Most Americans think that's kind of a good cutoff spot to be in. What they don't know is where the Democrat position is. <clears throat> that's something we haven't talked about. Every single Democrat senator, but one, voted for a bill that would allow abortion anytime, anywhere, for any reason, up until the moment of birth, and they ask you, the taxpayer, to pay for it. Ninety-six, or excuse me, eighty-six percent of the people in this country disagree with that position. So they are clearly on the radical side of it. It's our incumbent upon us to explain that. To Amisha, I know you want to weigh in on this because there's some discrepancies there that I know Democrats argue against. Uh, absolutely, uh, the the overwhelming majority of um, abortions in this country that are late term, and that's less than two percent of the overall abortion rate in general. Less than two percent are emergency situations where the life of the mother is at risk. The the fetus will not survive. It is already you know. Past Passed on, and the mother will die if it is not removed. This is a very personal issue to me because my sister had this. Um, she battled it in the state of Georgia and had to, and she wanted her baby. She fought for that baby, had already had the nursery created and all of those things. We had already had the baby mm -hmm. shower, and it was something she had to do because if she didn't do it, I would not have my sister today, and she already has two children. So it's really hurtful to hear Republicans push this narrative when women's lives are literally at risk, and it is something that is only done in emergency situations. David, the life of the mother yeah. is an exception in every single right. state, so that's not anything. Yeah. David, I, I do want to turn the conversation to, to what may possibly happen inside the House chamber, and that is what if, what if Democrats and or their invited guests heckle the president? How does he handle that? Well, they'll have practiced this, I think, probably— uh you know, yeah. over the weekend and, and maybe even, uh, you know, the first couple of days of this week, uh, you know, something coming from Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, something coming from a Democrat. So <laughs> Biden will be ready for it. I think if it comes from the other party, he'll be very strong, uh, you know, which is please sit down, show some respect to this chamber and to the American people. A um, little more complicated what's in your own party, but he'll be ready for it. I think that that's uh, maybe something, let's say, five, six, eight, ten years ago. Uh, although Bar Barack Obama did get heckled as well, uh, you know, from, I think, a member from South Carolina. So it's kind of a new era where you've got to practice not just the delivery of the speech, um, which is really important, but also if there's some interruptions. 
Amisha, you know, some people will remember 2020, and, and one of the reasons why Joe Biden won that campaign was voters remembered, you know, Scranton Joe, Uncle Joe, if you will. He's, some people call him Grandpa Joe now. He's gotten a little bit older. Um, does he still have that in him? Will, will, will that Joe Biden show up? Will, it, will he show up on the campaign trail? I think we're definitely going to see Scrappy Joe from Scranton. I love when he shows up, personally. Um, this, this Joe Biden, I think, understands what lies ahead. The polls are really close in, in all of the battleground states. And for him running against somebody who has 91 felony charges, um, who tried to steal an election, who was the instigator of January 6th, we should not be anywhere near the closeness that we actually happen to be in those polls. And I think that that is a reality that Joe Biden faces, realizing that he's fighting not only for the soul of our, our, of our nation, but also for the democracy writ large. Not only protections here, but protections of other democracies. He's going to go hard tonight. Hogan, former president, says he'll be tweeting in real time, play by play, fa fact checking, if you will. Uh, some, I'm people here might, for it. some people might find that interesting, but the president, uh, former President Trump, will be fact checking somebody. Yeah. Um, what can we expect from the former president? Well, look, I haven't talked to their camp about this, but I can most assuredly. Um promise you that he'll be talking about his record versus Joe Biden's. We've talked about this many times because this is so unique, a situation where you have a sitting president with a body of work that is impacting Americans right now versus a former president who had policies in place that impacted Americans in a different way. Those two things were going to be debated. That's the campaign. But the fact is the American people obviously felt better under Donald Trump. Poll after poll shows it. They like the policies better. They like the America first uh, mentality better. Those principles are something they want to go back to. The question is, where does that go between now and November. There's a long time to debate these conversations and, and have them. Uh, but I think uh, obviously Joe Biden's on a weaker footing tonight. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see how how um, physically and mentally uh, fit he is for this speech, because it, it's going to go on for a long time. I think time, a lot of Americans we'll are, are, are going to be watching for that as well. Hogan Gidley, Amisha Cross, David Pluff, it is always a pleasure. We thank you for your time tonight here on Top Story. And a reminder, you can catch our full coverage of President Biden's State of the Union address right here on NBC News. Hallie Jackson and I will join you at the top of the hour as we count down to the speech. And at 9 p.m. Eastern, Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie will anchor our coverage as President Biden takes the podium. We will see you then. But for right now, I want to turn to the forecast and the severe storm striking millions across the country. In Atlanta, widespread rainfall, submerging cars in floodwaters. Look at that. Dangerous winds downing trees onto homes and vehicles, stretching from the plains to the southeast. Those conditions expected to continue into the weekend. I want to right, get right over to NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns. Bill, walk us through what we're looking at right here and what's the next threat. Yeah, good evening, Tom. Uh, flash flooding is the first threat, and it's affecting millions of people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We have two severe thunderstorm watches. Severe thunderstorms is what we're worried about now, large hail damaging wind. Tornadoes will happen during the overnight hours. But let me get you into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Here's Dallas right here. Here's Fort Worth. This is the flash flood warning. They've already had about two inches of rain. Thunderstorms continued in this region. It's been a nightmare to travel for the evening commute throughout this region. This should be clearing up in the next two hours or so. We have one active tornado warning in southern Kansas here. This should be heading towards Coffeyville, Kansas. It's radar indicated. There's some storm chasers. I've seen pictures of it. It's spinning, but the tornado is not down towards the ground. It's not officially a tornado. It's just what we call a rotating wall cloud. The base of the thunderstorm is spinning. So severe weather tonight, Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls. We mentioned Dallas. And then as far as tornadoes go, this would be like 3 to 5 a.m. in the morning. So if you're in this region around Stephenville to Brady to Hamilton, just north of Clean, this region, about 3 a.m a.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. So make sure you have your weather radio on or your phone alerts on so you can get those warnings. Then tomorrow we take these severe storms to Louisiana, Mississippi, and into Alabama. And the other thing we have to watch out for is flooding. We just showed you those pictures of Atlanta. Everything's already soaked. And now you have this next storm coming. 10 million people are under flood watches. And we have what we call a moderate risk of flash flooding. Montgomery, Birmingham, and Atlanta. Tom, about three inches of rain is expected tomorrow in these areas that just saw the flooding yesterday. It should be a serious situation this time tomorrow. All right, Bill Karens for us. Bill, we appreciate that. In Philadelphia tonight, an urgent manhunt underway for multiple suspects who shot and wounded eight high school students at a bus stop. The shocking attack captured on surveillance video, marking a fourth straight day of gun violence on the city's transit system. Top officials now vowing swift action. NBC's George Solis is in Philly with the latest. Tonight, Philadelphia police are urging the public take a closer look at this shocking surveillance video. Investigators say it shows the chilling moments three armed suspects exit a stolen car, run up to a busy bus stop frequented by high school students, and indiscriminately fire more than 30 shots into the crowd. Eight teens between the ages of 15 and 17 were wounded. 
one of those teens now fighting for his life. These are individuals shooting at a crowd of kids. That's really concerning. So we need people to see that. This shooting, the fourth involving the city's transit system, SEPTA, and the second involving minors this week alone. Since Sunday, three people have been killed and 12 injured on SEPTA property. 11 of those wounded were teenagers, prompting a widespread response from top city officials. Now, this is what's extremely important to me as mayor of this city, that the people of this city know that we will not be held hostage. Just hours before the shooting on Wednesday, SEPTA Police Chief Charles Lawson declaring an aggressive approach to combating crime and gun violence on the transit system. We're going to target every criminal code on the books. But for the family and friends of 17-year-old Damian Taylor, it's too little too late. The teen was shot and killed on Monday as he waited for the bus. Several others were also wounded. We are just absolutely heartbroken and uh, angry. Uh, that innocent children walking home from school would be impacted by, by gun violence. Philadelphia police say there have been 55 murders in the city in 2024 so far, which is less than this time last year. As the investigation into this latest shooting continues, authorities are urging parents to get involved before another young life is claimed by gun violence. Go in those rooms and look under those tables and look under those, <coughs> those closets and get those guns out of the house. Because at the end of the day, many of these kids are coming from the same communities that they're shooting in, right? And they know who they are. All right, George Solis joins us tonight from Philly. So, George, Philadelphia, like New York, is having a real problem with keeping commuters safe. Why has SEPTA become such a target for criminals? Yeah, Tom, Philadelphia police are actually working under the possibility that some of these shootings may be all connected. Now, today, I asked Pennsylvania's Governor Josh Shapiro if he plans on deploying the National Guard here, as we saw it was deployed in New York City. He says he has no plans on doing so. Meanwhile, Philadelphia police and SEPTA police say they plan on stepping up police patrols in and around the transit system. Tom? George Solis for us tonight. George, we thank you for that. Now to the Middle East, where a deal for a ceasefire in Gaza has fallen apart after a Hamas delegation left talks in Cairo without a deal. This coming as Gaza faces a potential famine. I want to bring in NBC's Matt Bradley from London. Matt, a lot to talk about when it comes to Israel and Gaza. Let's start with those talks over the ceasefire. Why did the deal fall apart? Yeah, well, Tom, there's been a few different things that we're hearing from a few different people. The main sticking point on this deal, though, has been unchanged for the past several rounds of negotiations. For the past several months, Hamas is demanding Israel agree to a permanent ceasefire, and Israel has refused. And so far, Israel has only put up proposals for a temporary truce and an exchange of prisoners. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's prime minister, he stated repeatedly that Israel will not stop fighting in the Gaza Strip until they've achieved their goal of destroying Hamas. Now, meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal has reported that one of the top Hamas leaders in the Gaza Strip, Yahya Sinwar, he's the man thought to have been the architect of those October 7 terror attacks that set off this latest round of fighting. He's apparently pushing for an even harder negotiate, negotiating position. He believes that the entire world is rising up on defense of the Palestinians, and he believes that the U.S. is breaking up with Israel over these foreign policy issues. So he sees some daylight between the U.S. and Israel that can be exploited. This, again, according to The Wall Street Journal. Now, Israeli and American and Egyptian officials, they've all said that the negotiations aren't over. They may resume again shortly. But it's clear that there won't be a deal before Ramadan. And that's what all sides were hoping for. And as long as these negotiations go on, Tom, the Israelis are continuing to plan their attack on Rafah. Now, that's a city right on the border between Gaza and Egypt. That's where some one and a half million Palestinians, they're thought to be taking refuge from the war. It's where Israel told them to go. And international aid agencies have warned that an Israeli attack on Rafah could create a humanitarian disaster. Matt, I also want to get your take on what Peter reported earlier, the Americans, the U.S. helping with other countries to essentially build a temporary port in Gaza. What, what more do we know about this? Yeah, well, if the president and his European partners get their way, we could see some of this desperately needed food aid flowing toward the region by ship very soon. You remember just recently it was done in the past couple of days by airdrop. Now, according also to The Wall Street Journal, the actual delivery of aid, it wouldn't actually even involve any military ships. It would be contracted out to private shipping firms. 
Now, as for what this will actually look like, government officials have said that the construction of this temporary port, it won't require any American troops to put their boots on the ground in Gaza. That's one of the main stipulations behind this plan. And it would be built with a floating causeway to land to the Gaza Strip, connected essentially to ships. It would be ships that would become the port. And so these specially outfitted ships would allow incoming trans transport ships to dock against them, and that's how the aid would get to the Gaza Strip. Now, there's another big sticking point. How will it be distributed within the Gaza Strip? Another political decision, another negotiation. Tom? Okay, Matt Bradley, thank you. I want to come back here to the U.S. and to the nation's capital where we are broadcasting tonight. You are looking at live pictures. This is coming in right now. I want to give you guys a heads up, our viewers at home. We do not have control of this camera right now, but we are getting this feed in. This is um, just steps from the Capitol. This is Constitution Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue where pro-Palestinian protesters have blocked a key intersection there. This is, again, just blocks from the Capitol. Some people are sitting on the ground in the middle of the street with a massive Palestinian flag. We can see that police are out there. Um, it looks like uh, maybe other law enforcement agencies have also responded to the scene as well. A pretty big scene from what we're seeing right now. Again, these pictures just coming in, this info just coming in from our D.C. desk and our reporter Gary Grumbach, who's feeding this uh, information into us right now. Uh, we are less than 30 minutes from our coverage that will start of the State of the Union. The president expected to be at the House sometime around 9 p.m. We'll stay monitoring these developments to see what happens. We want to go back now to the war in Israel and Gaza. And as we mentioned, those airdrops are bringing food to people in desperate need for aid. NBC's Richard Engel was able to join a relief flight over Gaza today and has more for us. On an airbase in Jordan, we were given an inside look at what has become a last resort for getting aid into Gaza air dropping food and humanitarian supplies. So the planes have already been loaded. These are C-130 cargo planes. The mission today was run by the Jordanian military, a close U.S. ally. We watched the crew do its last minute briefs until it was time for takeoff. The food aid was on pallets and the bags on top are the parachutes fixed with yellow rip cords to open them. First, we flew over Israel the Israeli military granting permission, deconflicting the airspace so the plane isn't accidentally shot down. Israel looks peaceful from above. Then we reached Gaza, where the damage is clear and extensive. After Hamas's October 7th massacre, Israel is bombed and cut off Gaza so severely that people are now facing starvation. Officials from Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry say at least 20 people have already died from malnutrition. They've just given the signal that they're ready to drop. We are now over northern Gaza. Any moment now, these packets of food aid will begin parachuting down. Every bit helps, but aid groups say this is not a solution. The meals are for more than 20,000 people, but it's a drop in the bucket. 2.3 million people need help below. But for now, it's the only thing coming from the sky in Gaza that doesn't explode. The U.S. is also doing aid drops over Gaza, but this is not meant to be permanent. And as we saw today, it is far less efficient than truck deliveries and much more expensive. Tom? Richard Engel for us tonight. Still ahead, the takeoff scare in San Fran. A tire falling off a United Airlines flight midair and then damaging cars on the ground, the emergency landing that flight was forced to make. Plus, she calls herself a super mayor, but she's accused of misusing public money to fund her own lavish lifestyle and then vetoed a measure to investigate her. Top Story spoke to a village board member trying to get her out of office. And a rare sighting off the coast of Massachusetts, why experts say these images of a gray whale are something not seen, and get this, hundreds of years. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're heading to Illinois and mounting drama surrounding a small town's self-described super mayor who this week vetoed a call for an FBI investigation into her own spending habits. The village board claims she's driving them millions of dollars into debt, accusing the mayor of spending taxpayer money on things like lavish trips and billboards with her own face on them. NBC's Maggie Vespa has the story. 
This is Mayor Tiffany A. Henry, the people's mayor. She's a self-described super mayor. This is me, yes, me, super mayor. Whose likeness can be seen hung across her small Chicago suburb and on her social media channels. I am there for all my haters. It doesn't matter because I'm the mayor of all of Dalton. But tonight, Tiffany Henyard, the mayor of Dalton, Illinois, is struggling to silence growing calls for an investigation into how she spends public money. Now, we'll be victorious when all the dust clear. You see, mark my words. So with that being said, I'm going to go into this veto message. During a tense board meeting Monday, Henyard vetoed a measure calling for an outside investigation into her alleged misuse of public funds. Calling for an investigation of Mayor Tiffany Henyard. This after, the village board late last month called for the FBI, the U.S. attorney, and the Cook County Sheriff to investigate the village's finances, which trustees say the mayor is keeping under wraps while spending lavishly. We cannot continue to stand for millions of dollars being wasted on trips and things that do not benefit the community. Kiana Belcher is one trustee calling for that investigation. What is it that you all say she's spending public money on? We have not received a financial report since September of 2023. She alleges that last year the mayor racked up a million dollars in police overtime for her own personal detail. What, a weekend, possibly twenty-seven to thirty thousand dollars. Twenty-seven to thirty thousand dollars for a weekend. For, for the weekend, yes. Last March, where we when we still were receiving copies of the card. She also says the mayor spent one point three million dollars. We have love on ice today. Building this ice rink. Nobody can go over there unless she's having an event. Meanwhile, Belcher says vendors contracted by the village say they're not getting paid. The banners or the billboards with her face on them is that person not getting paid? Um, no, the person is not getting paid. It was 122 banners for 19000 Nine hundred some dollars. NBC News has reached out to Mayor Hendard, who, according to NBC Chicago, also works as township supervisor for a neighboring community, making a total salary of close to three hundred thousand dollars a year. So far, we've received no response. On Monday, the mayor alleged its trustees and other officials who are doing the spending. I didn't have no access to any bank account to make any decisions in our village. It was all up to them. Meanwhile, at last check, Belcher says this village of twenty one thousand was. Set $7 million in debt. She suspects that number has grown. Again, no response tonight from Mayor Henyard, but according to her social media, she plans to launch a podcast on Friday, so we may very well hear more from her then. At the same time, the Chicago Tribune is reporting the FBI is in the preliminary stages of an investigation into the village's finances. We reached out to the agency ourselves, and they declined to comment. As far as next steps go, in Dalton, Illinois, trustees say they plan to override the mayor's veto of their call for that investigation at their next meeting, which is scheduled for April 1st. Tom. Maggie Vespa for us. Maggie, thank you. Just ahead, a bill that could ban TikTok nationwide. Getting momentum in Washington, the legislation sparking backlash from social media users, the surprising notification from the app urging users to flood lawmakers with thousands of calls. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, we start with an update on that deadly Texas wildfire. Utility company XL Energy revealing their power lines may have ignited the fire that's still burning across the Texas panhandle. However, they disputed claims that they acted negligently in maintaining their equipment and said fire victims can submit a claim. The fire has killed at least two people, destroyed hundreds of buildings, and burned more than one million acres. It is believed to be the largest wildfire in Texas history. A United Airlines flight forced to make an emergency landing late today. New video shows a tire falling off the plane during takeoff in San Francisco. You see it right here. That tire blowing through an airport fence and damaging several cars. The Boeing 777 landed safely, though, in L.A. with more than 230 passengers on board. No one on the plane or the ground was hurt, thankfully. And look at this, an extremely rare whale sighting just 30 miles off the coast of Massachusetts. Images from the New England Aquarium show a massive gray whale near Nantucket. Experts say gray whales had been extinct from the Atlantic ocean for more than 200 years but if you have resurfaced in the last decade they believe this whale is the same one that was seen in Florida in December experts believe the new sighting may be linked to warming waters
Okay, next tonight, more news out of here in D.C. on a possible nationwide TikTok ban. A new bipartisan bill being proposed would force TikTok to cut ties with the popular app's parent company, ByteDance, or face an outright ban in the U.S. TikTok sending this notification to users 18 and up this morning, telling them Congress is planning a total ban on TikTok and urging users to contact their representatives. Lawmakers in favor of the bill emphasizing this bill is not a ban. But some members like Representative Jamal Bowman from New York have used TikTok to communicate with his more than 200,000 users. Bowman posted this message on TikTok today. Just want to let you know, as you know, once again, my colleagues are trying to ban TikTok, which is crazy. Let's bring in NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, can you tell us more about the bill and could we actually see a ban on TikTok in the U.S.? Well, we could because Steve Scalise, who is the top, one of the top Republicans in the House, said that he will put this bill on the floor next week in the House. And I have to tell you, despite those messages from TikTok users, despite those calls that we heard that members received all night to tell them to oppose this bill, uh, it certainly does have the backing of a lot of members on bipartisan sides of the aisle. It passed unanimously, Tom, out of the committee today. That suggests it could have an overwhelming floor vote next week. Still don't know its fate in the Senate. But reminder, this is about... Uh, TikTok's failure to separate its ties from its parent company, ByteDance, if it fails to do so, if it fails to transfer ownership to an American company, that's when the app could be banned from all app stores, all platforms. And it's not just TikTok, Tom. It is any app that is under control of a foreign adversary and certainly a big step, a bipartisan one that Congress is taking. So, Julie, you know, some users of TikTok and maybe some parents at home may be saying this all sounds familiar. Didn't former President Trump try to do this already where, where he wanted Oracle to take over the servers in the U.S. of TikTok? Yeah, he sure did, and it got caught up in litigation in the courts. But this time, Tom, is different, because this time, not only is there support from the White House for this move, not only is there support from Capitol Hill, but bipartisan lawmakers, really everybody here, you can't name an issue that is more bipartisan than this at this moment, has been in close contact, in close touch, and are pretty much on the same page to try and make this happen. There's been a lot of action in general to counter some of the aggression we've been seeing from China. Certainly, we saw the TikTok CEO in the hot seat last year in that blockbuster testimony here on Capitol Hill, it certainly seems like lawmakers are trying to accelerate this process. And again, they're planning on taking this up on a full House floor vote next week. Julie Serkin, for us from a very busy Capitol Hill, Julie, we thank you. Okay, time now for Top Stories Global Watch and a check of what else is happening around the world. We start with a suspected mass kidnapping in northeastern Nigeria. Local reports say members of the Islamic militant group Boko Haram are believed to have abducted 200 people who were living in a refugee camp. The victims are mostly women and children. The U.M. condemned the reported kidnappings and called for an unconditional release of those victims. Dozens of migrants rescued from the Mediterranean Sea after their boat capsized. New video shows the migrants swimming towards a rescue boat off the coast of Italy. The nonprofit who responded says the group was suffering from dehydration and fuel burns. At least one person has died. And Sweden has officially become NATO's 32nd member. Both Sweden and Finland had applied for membership two years ago following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Finland had become a member last year, but opposition from members Hungary and Turkey had delayed Sweden's ratification. The ceremony took place in Washington, and President Biden later issued a statement saying that the U.S. and its allies were now even safer as a result of Sweden's partnership. Sweden's prime minister will be there at the State of the Union tonight with President Biden. Welcome back. We're just over one hour away from the State of the Union and possibly the most important speech of President Biden's political career. And the excitement is building here in the nation's capital. I want to bring in moderator of Meet the Press and my good friend, Kristen Welker. Kristen, thanks for joining Top Story. Great to be with you, Right Tom. before this really busy night in Washington, right? Yeah. So I know you've been talking to your sources in the White House. What can the American people expect from President Biden? I think you are going to hear President Biden make his most fulsome argument yet for why he deserves another four years in office. He'll talk about how he sees his biggest accomplishment so far, including the fact that jobs have been added, inflation has come down. The challenge is, of course, a lot of Americans say they don't feel that. So I think there's going to be a big focus, Tom, on how he plans to make sure that Americans start to feel the fact that prices are coming down. He's going to have tax uh, increases on large corporations. So there is going to be a lot of focus on prices, but I think there's going to 
to be a larger focus on this theme of freedom and drawing a contrast with former President Trump, who is now officially his challenger. This rematch is on, Tom. But as you know, uh, the way in which he delivers this speech, because of all of the questions about his age, his fitness to serve, his performance is going to be just as important as the substance of yeah. his speech. You know, in these speeches over recent years, we've gotten some sort of in-chamber drama, if you will, the mm -hmm. back and forth between the president and members of Congress or even members in, in, in the galley, too. Uh, my question to you is, last year, the president was able to take that energy, take those moments and sort of own them. Do we think we're going to have a repeat that that's going to happen again and people may be sort of talking back to the president? We could. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some hecklers in the crowd. We know that the White House has said it's prepared for anything. They're preparing for it. I think the challenge for President Biden is not to go in too overprepared. Th that moment that you talk about last year was an organic moment. He flipped those jeers on on their head, and that's what made it effective. If he goes in with a line that feels too prepared, he could lose that feeling of authenticity, which is what made last year's moment so strong, Tom. But I have to tell you, I've been talking to my sources on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. They tell me that Speaker Johnson has said to his conference, please keep decorum in the hall tonight because he thinks that that is important. Will members of his conference listen? Probably some of them will, but not all of yeah, them. Yeah, not all of them. But we can also <laughs> see stuff from Democrats, too. You just don't absolutely. know. Well, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's an important point, because there is a division right now within the Democratic Party, particularly over the president's handling of the war in the Middle East. So you could mm -hmm. hear some outbursts when he starts to talk about the Middle East. We know that he's going to be discussing aid and the ways in which his administration plans to enhance aid that's getting into Gaza. So we will be watching very very closely to see what the reaction is in Congress. And we're going to be looking forward to your take right afterward as well. Kristen Welker, we thank you for thank joining you. us tonight. And we thank you for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in Washington, D.C. Stand by for our News Now State of the Union special, which starts right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.